Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be thermal regulation. So as always, let me get your objectives, and we'll get going. So by the end of this video, here are the things that I need you to know or be able to do. First one, understand the differences between endotherms and ectotherms, simple concept, and then explain various thermal regulatory strategies. So how do animals maintain a stable internal body temperature. So first thing, why do we need to regulate body temperature? Well, as we have talked about many times before, most chemical reactions happen best within a certain range, and it's usually a very small temperature range. If the temperature gets too hot, then proteins can denature, which means enzymes don't work. If temperature gets too low, then the molecules aren't moving around quick enough for them to actually collide with a high enough frequency to get anything done. So most animals are very sensitive to temperature changes, so the organism needs to work very hard to make sure that they maintain a constant and stable internal body temperature. There's two basic strategies for maintaining a body temperature, and that is endothermy versus ectothermy. If you are an endotherm, you are known as warm-blooded, and you produce your heat internally. So the outside temperature can change quite a lot, but you maintain a stable internal body temperature. If you are an ectotherm, you are known as being cold-blooded, and this means that any time the temperature outside fluctuates, your body temperature fluctuates also. And we'll talk about strategies that are used to prevent that fluctuation from being too bad in a second. But just for, no, endotherms, they can take care of their own internal body temperature. Ectotherms have to do use behavioral means in order to remain at a stable temp. So let's go ahead and start going through some strategies that organisms use to maintain an internal body temperature that is suitable. First one is going to be insulation, and two major forms of insulation. One, you got fat, as our walrus friend right there will show you. Um, fat has the, uh, I guess, the ability to insulate by making sure that blood vessels are kind of wrapped around with a nice warm coating. And so if you've got cold weather outside, that fat is going to keep that cold from sinking into your blood vessels. Other option on insulation is to have a nice warm fur coat that prevents body loss by holding it against the body. Next to insulation, we've got circulation. Now this is a really interesting situation <clears throat> called countercurrent exchange. I'll talk about that in a second. The two easy ones are constriction and dilation. So obviously your blood, since it is aqueous, it carries a lot of heat and it has the ability to give up or take in heat. So what bodies will do is if they are warm and they need to dump heat, they will vasodilate, which means that the blood vessels near the skin will open up. That increases blood flow towards the skin, and as that blood flows next to the skin, it dumps all that heat off through the skin to the atmosphere that's around it. Now, contrasting that, if a body is too cold, the veins and the arteries around the skin will constrict, which forces the blood into the warmer core of the body, and it prevents heat loss. At the um, level of blood vessels flowing past each other, we see something called countercurrent exchange. And what countercurrent exchange is, is it's a situation where an artery, which takes blood away from the heart, and a vein, which takes blood back to the heart, run next to each other so that they can exchange heat between one another. So as this warm arterial blood is warm because it's coming from the heart, core of the body flows this way, it runs next to a vein that is coming from the skin and is probably full of colder blood. As they run next to each other, this artery can give up its warmth to the vein. So this helps to maintain a stable body temperature by that artery giving up some of that warm blood to the colder vein, and it kind of helps to stabilize things. We also have evaporation. Now we've talked a lot about evaporative cooling, so you know sweating. As the body gets too warm, it starts to sweat. That sweat that builds up on the surface of the skin sucks up a bunch of heat and then evaporates to the atmosphere, taking that heat along with it. Another form of evaporative cooling is panting. You have seen dogs do this all the time. They open their mouths up, they pant. As saliva and liquid evaporates from their mouths, it takes the heat along with it. There's a lot of other organisms other than dogs that pant, but just know that it's a strategy for evaporative cooling. 
And we have got behavioral adaptations. Um, some examples of this would be basking in the sun. A lot of ectotherms do this. They will be cold and not moving so fast after an evening in the dark. As the sun comes up, they will hop out on a rock or the sidewalk or whatever so that the sun can warm up their, uh, their bodies. Um, in mammals, there are a lot of huddling behaviors. Also, insects show huddling behaviors where if it gets too cold, the organisms will huddle together, as our penguin friends that are on the side are showing us, and exchange body heat with one another so that they can be warmer. Like I said, we've seen this in penguins. Monkeys do this in colder areas. We have seen bees doing this. There's a lot of animals that show some sort of huddling behavior. And there's me metabolic changes. Um, if the body is too cold, the metabolism of an endotherm can speed up, and as it speeds up, it gives off a lot of extra heat. Now, note that this kind of changes the energy requirements of endotherms and ectotherms. Endotherms generally need to take in a lot more calories than ectotherms. Because ectotherms don't have to regulate their body heat, because they don't have to make extra body heat, they can eat far fewer calories because they're not burning calories to stay warm. If you're an endotherm, the you have the benefit of being able to speed up your metabolism or shiver to make more heat but it also means that you have got to eat more food in order to provide the raw material to burn and produce that heat so know that increasing metabolism is an option if you're an endotherm but it also requires that you take in more food all right last one as far as regulating the body temperature goes we talked about the thermostats and negative feedback loops about how like the thermostat has got a range that it works in for temperature. As the uh, room, let's say, gets cold, that triggers the thermostat to turn on, turn on until the room warms up, and then the thermostat shuts off. For our bodies, the thermostat is the hypothalamus. It is located very deep inside the middle of the brain, right here. Pituitary gland is right there. So if you were to cut a brain in half, you would find the hypothalamus in the middle. This is, amongst other things, the thermostat for the body. It regulates the temperature, and it keeps it within a range. Now, it's not like a set point where there's one temperature, and if the body isn't at this temperature, the hypothalamus goes off. But there is a range that it responds to. If the body gets too warm, it will activate responses like sweating, like vasodilation so that the blood will flow next to the sick skin. All of those things that we talked about for regulating temperature. If it gets too hot, the hypothalamus will trigger those responses. Now, if the body is too cold, then the hypothalamus will stop the responses that are uh, causing heat loss and initiate responses that are, uh, I guess, leading to the retention of heat, such as, you know, forcing blood flow to the core of the body, shivering, increasing metabolism, things like that. So know that the hypothalamus is the thermostat by which our body regulates its temperature. So I know that was a lot of stuff that just kind of like, boom, here's this, here's that, here's that. But hopefully it gave you a decent idea of how organisms regulate their body temperature. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.